Hello, everybody. Hi, welcome to the Bartlett Inclusive Spaces seminar series. My name's Kamna Patel. I'm the Faculty Vice Dean for Equality, Diversity and Inclusion. And in this seminar series, we're going to be exploring the contributions of staff, students and alumna of the Bartlett to the topic of inclusive spaces. And that's really talking about how do we create, how do we think about spatial equity? I am absolutely delighted to be joined today by an alumna of the Bartlett. I'm going to introduce her in just one moment. I want to run through a little bit of housekeeping before we begin. Can I please remind you that this session is recorded and will be added to the faculty YouTube channel, the Bartlett EDI webpage and forwarded to registered attendees. We encourage you to submit a question for the speaker at any point during this lecture by clicking on the Q&A function on the bottom of the screen. You can submit your own question and or upvote the questions of others. We will hear from our speaker, Tampa, for the first half of the session and begin the Q&A in the second half before ending promptly by 2 p.m. So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Tampa Husna Yasmin Fellows, who is an award-winning British architect. She co-founded the interdisciplinary practice, Our Building Design, the charity Maman Foundation Trust, and two organizations that promote and support architects from ethnic minorities in the UK, the Fame Collective and the Asian Architects Association. Tampa is a senior lecturer in architecture at the University of Westminster, where her teaching draws on her research methodologies on interdisciplinary approaches to design. She's also a PhD researcher, and her practice-based research focuses on community participatory methods and architectural responses to the changing climate, landscape, and social practices in Bangladesh and in the UK. She was awarded the Reba J Rising Star Award in 2017, a commendation on the Reba President's Award for Research in 2019. And for her architectural work, she has received the SEED Pacific Rim Community Design Network Award in 2018 and the Architecture Sans Frontier Award in 2017. Tampa has been appointed to be on the design review panel for the Southwark Council Planning Department, which is an advisory role over the past two years. And Tampa, fortunately for us, studied architecture at the Bartlett School of Architecture for her part one to part three, completing her part three in 2011. It is my real pleasure to welcome such an esteemed alumni back to the Bartlett to share her experience and her knowledge with us all. So Tampa, over to you. Thank you, Kamala, for such a kind introduction. Um, um, <clears throat> I'll just start. I'd just like to start by thank you, thanking you for inviting me to this um, such an exciting um, seminar series, uh, Exclusive Spaces. I'm delighted to be back uh, at the Bartlett to share some of our projects. So um, I am going to focus on some of our case study projects from uh, various organisations that I'm part of. And I, I would like to focus um, and, try and try to address some of these questions, following questions. How can architecture enable the voices of underrepresented communities to enable spatial justice? How can architects design for social value creation in places, buildings and neighborhoods? And how can designing inclusive spaces help us respond to the climate injustice? Um, and also, I'd like to say that um, uh, some of the projects belong to um, these organizations that I'm, I'm part of. And most of our projects are from our building design. Our building design um, is a practice and the projects implement architectural practice methods that translate and enable marginalized and local voices to be heard at various levels um, of design projects. So the first part of the um, of the presentation will focus on this project, which is in which was situated in Bangladesh in a remote village called Rajapur, and it's a women's um, literacy and healthcare centre. So um, I'd like to begin by introducing the charity that um, delivered this project, it's Manan Foundation Trust, which um, I co-founded with uh, members of my family. Um, and the name comes from my late father, Professor Manan, who was born in Rajapur in the village. And our 
our charity predominantly engages with uh, disadvantaged communities in rural Bangladesh. And we started um, the, this, we, we co-founded co this charity in 2011. Um, so how did it all start? So um, the year 2011 is quite a significant one. It's the year when I completed my part three at, at the Bartlett. Um, and after completing my part three, I wanted to have a break from architecture. I wanted to do some, something completely different. So I wanted to travel to the, the village um, in Bangladesh called Rajapur, where my father was born. And my father had passed away um, many years ago when I was a child. So, and we'd lost touch with the community there. So I wanted to reconnect um, to, with my roots in Rajapur. So I, I traveled there and I lived there um, and I, practice um, ethnographic practice um, by um, observing the community and how how they live. So um, just to give an overview of where where the site is. So Bangladesh, um, as, as most of you may know, um, is um, has a boundary with India and Myanmar. And the project um, Rajapur is sorry, um, is basically southeast of Dhaka, the capital city, and Bangladesh is known for its rivers. Um, Bangladesh is a low-lying country, which is broadly seen as a floodplain, um, and the majority of the landscape shift between water and, and land with periodic flooding. The riparian areas are most vulnerable to the shifting landscape as its inhabitants face the changing climate head on. The uh, floodplains created by shifting um, of sediments or silts deposited by rivers are the basis for productive ecosystem and agriculture dependent on the rich nutrients present in the silt shifted by the rivers. Um, I, so I wanted to um, give you just a really quick snapshot of the contrast between the, the rural landscape and the urban landscape um, in Bangladesh. So the cities are um, ha have been experiencing for the last decade or so um, a rapid urban growth and there's a huge demand for um, uh, just building and construction industries growing have, have grown and is con continues to grow and so the demand for um, bricks uh, which is basically put and um, has put a lot of pressure on the the rural landscape um, because the, the main material for the urban, um, in the urban context for building is, is uh, fired brick, engineered brick. So what, what is it like? What was it like when I first arrived? So when I first arrived in Rajapur in 2011, I wanted to get to know the community. So the way I, want, I did this was um, I volunteered to teach um, English classes in the local primary school. And it's, it's by um, being in the school with the children, with the parents, I got to know how the community are adapting to the changing and extreme climate and also um, the, some of the social issues that they face. So for example, um, this is the only school in, in, that's shared between four villages in the area and the secondary school would mean that you have to travel outside of the village. Um, so that, that means that usually normally what happens is that the the girls do not continue their um, education beyond the primary level so they're left behind and they, they so the, the girl on the left you can see in the building is one of my students and they this is what usually happens they help out um in in the fields and face an early marriage and also so there was a lack of education access to education um especially amongst the women in the village also what we've heard the stories that we've heard from the villagers are the, the lack of access to healthcare. So the nearest um, hospital is about 50 kilometers away. And we want, as, a, as the trust, uh, Manan Foundation Trust, we wanted to address this, these issues. Um, and, and I've also realized that the architectural practices, the, the building practices are very much meshed and embedded in the, in the cultural practices of how people live. So for example, it's an annual ritual for the, for the women uh, who had an expertise in building with earth to be um, plastering the floor of, of their houses or plastering the walls of their houses. And the houses uh, were built with, with a material palette that can, um, you know that consisted of 
woven uh, bamboo um, uh, walls or uh, earth walls or brick walls. Um, very rarely it's, it's five brick walls or tin, but they people took very care to care of what their front door looked like, for example. Um, and, and they heavily rely on fish farming and uh, rice. So I wanted to know a bit more about the village and I wanted to un understand um, you know, what, it, what it is um, that consists in, in the grounds, in the landscape. And I couldn't find any map. It's, it's very difficult to find maps of remote places in Bangladesh. Um, maps, uh, some of the maps that exist uh, of this area are, go back to the colonial um, times when the only thing that appeared in the maps uh, were the boundaries, the, the legal ownership of, of the land. So um, the, one of the tools that um, we used was called Transect War, which is a uh, participatory um, design strategy. Um, so it's, it's basically a walk together with the local people, with the community to explore the landscape, to explore the water resources, um, the sanitation, the condition of living, and so on, and and you know it's through observing and listening and asking questions and producing a series of map mapping diagrams. Um, here you can see the pools, um, which is the rainwater collecting pools that the people heavily rely on, which are called puku, and they um, farm they, they fish farm in these pools and they have access to water during during droughts. I've also noticed while walking that there's a huge amount of bamboo that grows in the village and, and we've mapped where they are, it's up there. And the building that I'm focusing on today in, in the first uh, half of the presentation sits here, which is in the community hub um, of the village near the, the primary school and also the mosque. Um, sorry, yeah, so... Um, these, these maps uh, basically um, helped, uh, helped me to understand the context from the, the lens of the, of the community and what's important to them and you know, what, what establishes a boundary between neighbors. And it helped me really um, to, to uh, develop a relationship with the people that I walked around with and understood their context. So how did we start the building process of the Rajapur Women's Literacy and Healthcare Centre? We, we first started with formal meetings and we realised actually these meetings were heavily dominated by the elders. They were heavily dominated by those with power um, who spoke in meetings, but uh, the, the people who would be likely to be using our facilities didn't um, uh, engage and didn't speak. It's just the etiquette of the the culture of formal meetings. So we had to improvise ways uh, to overcome this, this issue to encourage um, more people to engage, as many people to engage as possible. And architectural drawings uh, we found to be another, something that hindered um, engagement as well, because people immediately just think, you know, they, they don't really understand, they don't know how to address uh, how, how to address what's put in front of them. So we, we had to scrap using architectural drawings immediately. Instead, we started improvising these workshops where we encouraged drawings from the, the community. So we started off drawing with children um, and the both children and the parents, um, they, they translated each other's ideas through drawings that the children did. And the, the children also uh, basically shared what they thought a community building could look like. So yeah, as I mentioned in these, these formal meetings, um, we, we were trying to improvise ways to engage, the, especially the women who are underrepresented. Uh, we used models. Models were a could, could, uh, really good way to um, speak in three dimension, if you like, to, uh, to communicate. Um, but still, we, we realized the women were being represented by um, men and a man in their family who would represent them. So um, what another way we tried to um, overcome these issues were to by by actually walking around and acting out on site. So we you know we acted out, we asked questions about you know the etiquette of the social practices of men and women and, and how they use a, a community space. Um, and also this, these methods have really helped us to understand the, the ground condition, the climate, the extreme conditions of the climate of different times of the year uh, and how people um, 
uh, adapt to those. So the, the other methods we used, um, which were absolutely amazing because they were so popular amongst the, the villagers, um, was making workshops. And we used local materials to make uh, prototypes and to understand the materials, constraints and advantages. Um, bamboo is one of them. And we found that, again, bamboo had a stigma and the community uh, saw the bamboo as a material that is not used for permanent buildings, it's for a temporary structure. So, um, so how, how do we overcome this? Because uh, there is, you know, that there's a, there's a question of budget. So we, you know, bamboo is very cheap and it's readily available with no cost of travel delivery. Um, so we, we found ways, we found people in the village who knew how to treat the bamboo to achieve longevity. Um, and this is, this is one way we overcome that problem. This became really popular. People wanted to learn how to treat the bamboo. Same with earth. Earth also has a stigma in the in the village, although it's been it is heavily used by majority of the population. But because it's a community building, um, especially elders and those with uh, with the voice in the in the community felt that it, earth did not represent uh, a building that should be for community. It should be you know it's, it's a domestic material. It's material for domestic buildings. Um, but earth has such beautiful qualities um, and it's perfect for that climate, the extreme climate. And the women in the village understood that because they work with earth and they build with earth. So we hosted these um, workshops with the women um, and that enabled them to become integral part of, our, of the construction. But again, we, we have faced a hurdle where women were too shy to come to site. They wouldn't want, they don't want to build in front of the men and because that's not how, you know, they, they build in their own courtyard in, within the privacy of their home. So we came up with a strategy where they would teach us how to, um, how to mix the earth. So on site, the rammed earth um, element, the lower part of the building would be built on site, but the women would contribute through earth blocks. So they would build their blocks at home, dry them and bring them to site to be installed. And these are some of our drawings that we um, use for dissemination um, of the knowledge of what is a perfect mix for that region for building with earth to um, achieve optimum uh, structural property. Um, drawing, so yeah, so we scrapped formal plans and sections, but started drawing really, uh, you know, rough sketches on site with the people that built with us. And these are some of the sketches that we retrieved from the site. And these are our post-completion drawings. So it ended up being in the corner of um, this, this the public uh, community hub, um, where the there was an, there's an existing pool, existing pond, um, and we didn't want to um, interfere with it because it attracts huge. Uh, it has a huge, rich ecology that uh, you know attracts fish during the fl flooding season and kingfisher. So we decided to raise it. So that's when we had to use the concrete because. Uh, it had to be floodproof um, for the platform. And, and then the rest of the building is made out of earth and, um, and bamboo. So the, the, the way we separated the two process of the, of the material, uh, it, it, we decided to design it um, so that they don't interfere with one another because there are two different teams of people working um, in, in this way. So one wouldn't hold the other one up. So that's how we, we, we separated where the structure is from, from the earth walls. Yeah, so yeah, so these are the drawings that explain um, some of the conditions of the buildings um, responding to the site. So the, the elevations are very different, um, as you can see, because they, they respond to the way uh, the cyclone moves through the site, the, the way the extreme flooding moves across the site. So we had to, it's, it's through engagement with the community that we realized how the path of these extreme weathers would be passing through the throughout the year. Um, and, and that's how we could respond architecturally um, with, with various different types of elevations. Um, and the perforation of the earth wall um, enables um, evaporative cooling from, from, from low, below the building. 
um, to keep the building cool throughout the year. So in the summer, when I when I last visited in 2019, when it was 50 degrees, this was the coolest building in the village, um, which was which is excellent, really. Um, yeah. So yeah. So these shows um, the the the, the evaporative cooling is moving through the perforated uh, rammed earth walls and also the bamboo walls. Some of the photos when the building was first opened, this is a very much loved uh, by, the, the, by the community, especially the women, they, they feel safe here. This, this is a safe space for them. This is a safe community space for them, which was lacking in the village because the men had a lot of tea stores in every corner of, of, of the village, but women didn't have any public space for, uh, to congregate. And this is, this is also hosting income generating um, skills classes. So we have 105 women graduating since 2018 from this building um, and with core skills of how to start their business in tailoring um, and other crafts. And also we have health and hygiene um, uh, classes as well. We also host free health camps, which are extremely popular amongst everyone in the, in the community, especially the women and the children. Um, we've also attracted some uh, visits from the architectural schools in Bangladesh. So these are some of the students and professors who visited. Um, so I'm going to conclude this project um, with, with an animation that I have produced um, for the post occupancy uh, evaluation. So the, this animation documents the collective consciousness of the village atmosphere. Um, as you can see that um, the village, uh, the, the side goes through um, a hybrid of, of water, extreme flooding and also um, dry, dry weather. And it also attracts uh, the kingfisher and the, and the fish. It's, it's, it, it's a collective consciousness of the, the village atmosphere, of the changing climate and the ecology of the, of the village. And the process of engaging and collaborating with the community members in Rajapur um, had enabled us to acquire that knowledge of, of the site in that way. Um, so yeah, so we, through this uh, collaboration, we understood the, that the soil had uh, increased in salinity and it had lo lost its moisture and then we could respond to it in our building process um, through this, um, through this understanding with the community. And um, yeah, so, so the building went through uh, three phases. So the first phase was to build this platform um, and after, after that year, we went back and did more fundraising to do the rest of the building. We, we came back and we heard that, yeah, the kingfisher came back to the site, which was excellent. That means, you know, the, the ecology maintained um, it, uh, how it was. Um, yeah, and the, these, this is, uh, yeah, remains a, a building that is used by the community and much loved. So um, I'm going to now move on to the adaptation strategies that, um, that are practiced in rural Bangladesh. So I'm going to first highlight uh, these uh, projects by the char communities. So the char communities have managed to convert chars, which are islands, they're periodic islands, they appear every five years and they um, disappear. And they've uh, managed to grow vegetation to make them permanent. So they, they've learned to live in, on these islands uh, to understand uh, exactly, you know, how, uh, what kind of roots would keep the, the structure, the roots that, that would uh, stabilize the, the structure of the soil to, to provide structural support to the river banks and preventing erosion. And these are some of the floating gardens where they grow the food. So we've translated that information um, and in drawings and to communicate and disseminate this information to other remote uh, communities who are also facing similar problem of growing, um, challenges of growing food in, during flooding. Um, and also, you know, how to fish farm during the flooding season without using your fish. So after we went back for post occupancy evaluation, we wanted to understand different ways, uh, you know, we could, what are the different needs, uh, other needs of the community and how, how they're adapting to the extreme climate. And we did this through drawings. So these are some of the drawings by the children of, of their response to the post-occupancy um, evaluation workshops and some of the drawings of the calendar of adaptation of extreme climate and social practices drawn by, by the, the community. Um, yeah, so, sorry, I'm just having a um, 
Yeah, so we, we realized that it's not uh, enough to just host generic workshops with, with everyone in the village. It doesn't work because pe the etiquette, the social practices are such that uh, different uh, groups of the, the community behave differently. Um, so we had to, had to have separate workshops with uh, various groups, which, which were excellent because um, people, you know, the, the groups responded, they felt more confident when they're, they're, they're within their own groups. And um, this enabled us to sh share uh, the local skills um, through making and drawings. And then, you know, on the left, you can see like where we are recording the, the, their interpretation, community interpretations of adaptations of, of the extreme weather through drawings and making. Um, and it helped us communicate um, the design processes that already exist in the community. So we're, we're learning from the community and disse disseminating to, with others. And also it gives voice to the children as well, these, these workshops, because they um, feel that they can uh, voice their opinion about how their community buildings or um, you know, the projects in the community um, could be run and uh, could entail, which was a really important um, part of our work. Um, so from these uh, workshops, we, um, there was an, an issue with, because we went in the drought in the, in the summer, issues of losing, losing moisture in the soil. So together we, we made this, um, this prototype, a tool if you like, to collect the high level of moisture that's present in the air at dew point at uh, sun, sun rises. Um, and it was really easy to make and made by people in the workshop and then replicated in other people's back, back gardens for growing food. COVID-19 response, so how do you, how do you work uh, remotely with communities? Because all our travel um, plans were cancelled, we couldn't travel to Bangladesh. Um, so we had to quickly identify local champions um, who we worked with and spoke, speak to them on the phone because the internet's not available. And we worked out um, the, the three key things that needed to happen really quickly, communicating with the community, understanding their needs and participatory design to, to disseminate maybe or create relationships. Um, and we found that best way to do, do that, you know, public announcement of really important um, information of public health for coronavirus, how to keep the community safe, was through the Imam. Imam was our key uh, contact, the, 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 the priest, if you like, of, of the village mosque. Uh, he announced it through the mic and also posters that we designed, you know, those are a great way to uh, communicate information. Um, some videos online and also um, social media, but we realized that the phones were, uh, the smartphones are owned by men, so you're excluding the women from that information. So we had to think of other ways of um, reach out to the women. So, you know, door-to-door so -door visits, standing in the courtyard, standing in the veranda to speak to the women to understand what they need and also text messages worked really well as well and then we moved on to hosting um, a number of workshops to disseminate public health information and you know and to understand and to hear back from the community what was in need um, you know, one of them was the hand washing the other one was um then and then they moved on to these these champions local champions then moved on to these uh, design workshops with the children to um, raise awareness about social distancing. Um, and so through making and drawings that, that they learn how to keep distance and what, what is the distance of required distance um, that needed for COVID-19. Um, so yeah, these, those are great projects that we, we did remotely with the community, um, mask making, um, a quiz for um, disseminating public health information and, and other design projects. Um, Nineteen in. Oh, sorry. Yeah. So th these are my projects in London with my students um, in, my, in our studio, and we're exploring COVID nineteen response in Peckham. Um, and uh, so yeah, so the we we went out to the well, the students went out to to the community and spoke to the people on the street to find out what what issues that they were facing and. For example, in here, the, the closure of Rye Lane, um, uh, some of the community members who, who work in the, in the market and own, own businesses 
have expressed that have is really having an impact on their businesses because uh, the, there's no access to the, the customers are not coming on the bus to or, or being able to drive and park to, to do their shopping. So yeah, so our our way of um, responding to that, one of my students have responded to this um, rent rentable uh, room bag from the bus stop, for example. And then you know there are other ways um, that they thought about how to help the local traders improve to give confidence to the customers when they come in and shop uh, at the during the time of the lockdown uh, when when you uh, when you have the ease of the lockdown. Um, the other thing we, we have found uh, in, in Peckham Special in Riley is that there is a correlation between the air quality and also the, the, the income of people and uh, house prices. So, for example, in that this corner uh, of Riley where the, the air quality is at toxic level, uh, you have um, uh, low income families living there, uh, kind of shielding um, the affluent areas of Peckham, where the air quality is very, um, you know, much better, and the house prices are, you know, amazingly high, um, and people's incomes are in, in amazingly high. So there's a correlation between the income gap, uh, house prices, and air quality. Um, and previously, we looked at um, other areas of London, um, and this is, for example, these these are examples of uh, students creating tools to engage with the community to talk about issues that they have expressed, they voiced was was of concern. For example, the river noise by the village um, a residential area, and again, we found that the, the cheaper house house um, the, sorry the the cost of living um, where was it's cheaper is closer to areas where there are um, environmental challenges. Um, yeah, so these are some of the examples of that project. Um, so yeah, so now I'm coming towards the end of my, I don't know how I'm doing with time, um, towards the end of my presentation, I think I'll run through that really quickly. Um, I'd like to talk about uh, the organization FAME, which um, stands for Female Architects of Minority Ethnic. Um, and basically, it all started uh, during the pandemic. And um, this, this is a research based network founded to support women of diverse background and ethnicity um, in architecture and the built environment. And um, FAME is responding to an urgent need for understanding how race and gender affects established and young practitioners um, and uh, practitioners from diverse background, knowledge, and practices by engaging in conversations about the barriers in architecture and the built environment. Um, and the aim is to raise awareness of the barriers, the inequality and lack of diversity in architecture and built environment, um, and, and demand change that responds to our collective challenges. So these are some of the, uh, the quotations that um, I have put here on, on the slide from our participatory um, event that we hosted. Uh, it was hosted by Architecture Foundation in December last year. So some of the things I would like to read out. So through these conversations with many like ourselves, we realize that there are systematic issues to, that hold us back, whether in education or in practice of architecture. Um, and uh, someone else said, my view about the barriers and what we can do is inspire confidence and have role models, people who look like us, um, then they'll believe, in, they, they'll believe that there is a seat at the table for them when they finish. Um, and, and, you know, some of the barriers are hidden from a long time until somebody raises them. So we're creating a platform where we, we can openly discuss these barriers uh, because I'm, I myself have faced um, some, you know, some huge challenges in practice. Um, and yeah, so visibility is one of the key things that we found that people will talk about that you can't be what you can't see. So if you, if you see nobody at the top who represents you, you won't want to be there. And, and this is, you know, it, it's, a, it's really true, this, this for me as well, uh, when I worked in other practices. Um, and one, one of the stark, one of the really um, appalling thing uh, that we found um, was, was actually our keynote speaker, Sunita, had um, presented, is that from part one to part three, you see that all of the majority, um, sorry, all of the minority groups are dropping out 
except the white students, who increased from 59.8% at part one to 89.7% at part three. Black students at part one, 6.4%, um, and at part three, 2.7%, and Asian students at part one, from 6.8% at part one to part three, 1.5%. So yes, but there's a, these are quite shocking statistics how, um, you know, we, it starts out really well with, uh, you know, uh, people from all backgrounds joining at part one. And then the, the statistics are showing that uh, they don't get to part three, they drop out for whatever reason. Um, and we want to explore these reasons through our um, uh, future um, platforms as well. Um, so our next event is uh, going to be hosted by New London Architecture in 10th of March, um, which will be looking at, um, with the keynote speaker, looking at uh, pathways to success through a fame perspective, uh, through a female artist or minority ethnic perspective. So yeah, please, please do join us. And also please join us in fame or Manon Foundation Trust. Um, uh, because we're always looking for volunteers um, and yeah, it, it's a great, these are great projects that we have lined up, um, some of the great projects that we've lined up that you could get involved in. So yeah, please do, to, do get in touch. Uh, we'd love to have you join the team. I think I'll end here. Um, I think, yeah, I've got two minutes to spare. So I think I did well. So um, yeah, thank you very much. You did wonderfully well. Thank you very much, Tampa. And thank you everyone for the questions that you've submitted. Tampa, could I ask you to stop sharing your screen? Yeah, sure. We can have a bit more of a discussion, what looks like a little bit more of a discussion. Yeah. We've had quite a few questions, so I want to maybe group a few of them together and um, frame them in um, sort of the overarching themes. And one that keeps coming up or a recurring theme is really speaking to your work in Bangladesh and around gender and gender relations, gender power relations which is quite implied, it's heavily implied in a lot of the work that you um, were doing around traditional society structures, um, feminist theory and practice. You don't use that term, but I think that's what it was. So let me skip to Adrian's question here and ask a little bit about some of the suspicion or perhaps hostility that you might have encountered from uh, males in the village, particularly elders who might have felt a little bit uncomfortable with the newfound positions of space and power that women particularly were finding themselves in. Could you speak a little bit more about how you negotiated this terrain of gendered power relations and particularly how you engaged, encountered, um, worked with the men in the village? Okay. Yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. Um, yes, I'd love to share some of the some of my uh, conversations um, that I had, um, which were really interesting. Um, so yes, de definitely, it, it, it is uh, it, it's different because um, I, you know, I and my, which I forgot to mention actually, the three of the co-founders are all women. Um, so my my two sisters who are doctors who are also running all the health uh, health camps, and my mother she's running uh, the education. Uh, programs so yeah so when we go there and we run these projects i can see i can see that you know people might wonder hang on you know <laughs> these are not like the women in the village um however um and you know the people were open about uh how they felt um and and they they had expectations because we're not from from the village uh, so for example um, one of the elders said to me, you studied in the UK, you studied architecture in the UK, and you, you came to the village and you were asking us to build with earth. Why not glass? Why not concrete? Why, why are you imposing this, uh, you know, old ancient way of building? And, and, you know, I, what I had to, couldn't say was actually it's coming from the women of the village that they wanted to build this way, because that's a way of engaging um every, you know making it an inclusive team uh, I, you know i didn't want to get into the politics of that one way of uh, addressing one good way of addressing that was to have property tea at different uh different households with different materials so what we decided to do because i you know i wanted to um understand what it feels like 
because I said, look, I don't understand what it feels like to be in these buildings with different materials. Why don't we go and visit these buildings uh, in, in the community and have cups of teas and see what it feels like in the really, really extreme hot weather conditions. And it worked remarkably well because we, you know, we sat down with no fan, with, you know, sweat pouring down, drinking hot tea in some of the houses. And that's not what you do in the middle of the day. Um, and, and then we went to the, the, the houses that were built by women and they usually use for utility purposes, so like the kitchen, for example. And we sat in those earth buildings and we didn't sweat. And, you know, that was one of the way of negotiating that, you know, this material, give it a go. It's actually would be good for saving costs. It would be good for keeping cool inside the building because we can't afford a fan. We, we don't want to pay for electricity to start with. There's no electricity at the moment in the building because it's used during the day. So yeah, that's how we negotiated using uh, so that's one of one example of you know the expectations because you're from abroad or you're from the outside of the community and because we're a woman. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that answers the question. It does, it absolutely does, I think. I, I think it does. Um <clears throat> I want to ask you a little bit, building on that. Clearly, you are central, you are instrumental to these kinds of methodologies working. So I'd like to ask you to reflect a little bit about your position and, and questions of positionality when it comes to enacting these kinds of methodological approaches. And, and then, we, then we're gonna move on to the, the question about um, translating these participatory approaches to other contexts and cultures, because I think you're central to some of that. Um, yes, thank you for that. Um, definitely, so when I first started, um, it was very important for me to build that relationship. That's why, you know, architecture didn't come into any of the questions or any of the conversations. It was more about uh, getting to know the people, getting reconnecting with the root uh, of my root and telling people that actually my father went to the school. You know, I, this is why I'm teaching at this school and getting to know the parents. And I think it's those relationships that you build with with people that become central to practicing this way. Um, it's, you know, it's not about having some kind of design agenda or, you know, uh, it, it comes later because, you know, you can find those design agenda within the community, but it's initially, it's about uh, people and the relationship that you build with, with the community that becomes central so do you think that these techniques, these participatory approaches can translate into contexts? And what would be one or two things that you think are particularly important when looking at translating participatory approaches like the ones you've tried? I'm, I'm quite reluctant to use the same method uh, in different contexts because I think every context is unique. Um, so, for example, our uh, exploration in Peckham, it becomes quite personal to me because I grew up in Southwark um, and I grew up knowing how the communities are struggling in that part of London. So, you know, immediately I could say, yeah, I know, I know that's High Street and I know that school because I used to go there and you can start having conversations with people. But I haven't worked anywhere like this where I didn't have a connection. So I, I, I don't know, how, I haven't tried it, but I, I, do, I do strongly believe that you, you, it isn't something that you could uh, just you know, pick from one context and put it in another. It's very much site specific, very much uh, embedded in the way pe the social practices and the way people live and the relationships that you create with them. And maybe it is possible to use similar approaches, but you need time and you need to build that relationship with people uh, and, and understand what would be right for that specific community. Mm -hmm. From that, I want to move to a question that's posed here by Soraya, which is, do you think that the UK government, or in this case, Southwark Council, has been open to taking on board um, the ideas that would allow this kind of cultivation of an inclusive space? Um, I think it would be, be a bit unfair to uh, just focus on Southwark because I think they're not abnormal in the way that they do things. It, you know, majority of the councils work that way. 
Um, but yeah, as as uh, as a whole in the in the whole of the UK, I think, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, especially with what we've gone through with the pandemic, the you know these are so needed. These kind of methods are so needed because of the healing process, because of un understanding you know how we move on from the pandemic, and we cannot uh, turn our back on what happened, and especially especially you know uh, how it highlighted or uh, highlighted for example the health inequalities in in london uh, sorry especially in london I, I i'm very london centric i'm very mindful of that because i grew up in london but um and other parts of the uk and going forward and you know all, all, all those contributions from the frontline workers and being paid so, you know so so not not uh, sorry they're paid not reflecting what they're contributing all those things i think we they need to be heard or voices need to be heard moving forward and um and i believe i, I honestly do believe that uh implementing some of these methods could work um it does take a lot of time it does take a lot of effort to build uh trust and relationship with communities but there are people like me who would be, you know, really willing to get involved. Um, it's just finding that opportunity that comes in into my whole thing about the next Spain uh, event where we'll be exploring um, the the basically um, the whole framework and and part, you know local authority framework and how difficult it is to navigate through that for someone like me who's a sole practitioner how could I get involved? How could I get it? that? These are questions that I would like to pose to local authorities. How could I help the local authorities to, to engage with the local community to, to hear the voices, the unheard voices, which is so needed um, at this time. Um, so yeah, that's something I think needs to be um, addressed, the, the framework and how, how uh, especially the, the professions of Built in the built environment from Bain communities, how they're not they're not represented, how they're underrepresented. Um, so yeah, that's sorry, I I I, I answered the question with questions. <laughs> Always fine in an academic seminar. Yeah. <laughs> Almost the norm, I'd say. Uh, I want to skip from that to a question raised here by Mike, which is to what extent does your work act as a critique of conventional architectural practice? He's using the term starchitects here that represent the power structure of the profession. And I guess what you're describing is a little bit more bottom up with diffused power. Yeah, How yeah. Um, well, <laughs> um, I, I would, someone once told me that um, we, we are trained at architecture school to be uh, actually giving service to something like 1% of, of the whole world's population, because we have this dream of doing this amazing um, trophy-like building. But what about the rest of the population of the, of the world? Um, and I, I, have, I, I have a feeling that this way of practicing, the bottom-up way of practicing, it is a, there is a lot of room for us to be practicing this way, because there are a lot of people who would want to get engaged in practicing this way. I don't mean architects, I mean non-architects, um, because, um, because it's, it's about managing, it's about managing expectations of, uh, you know, the budget, expectation of how people live, expectation of uh, social practices and, and so on. And some of those things I don't think we consider as start, you know, being in, in a big practice, for example. Um, and because we always have this big client in mind. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's just another way of doing architecture and, and there is nothing wrong with doing it this way. And we don't learn it. We don't learn this way of practicing or uh, how to practice this way at at architecture school currently and um, I mean I myself don't teach my students I mean we, we're beginning to introduce uh, community engagement but you know the rigid structure of uh, the, the academia it, it may we need far more time than just a semester or two to to develop these skills but I'm starting to do, do it that way so hopefully 
next generations of students uh, from my, especially my studio, they, they always have at the back of their mind, I need to engage with the community that I'm building for, you know, not just uh, tell them at the end, this is the building and here's the public consultation, come and see it, what do you think? That doesn't work for most of the people who live in Salah, for example. Um, so yeah. I guess there's a bit of a solution offered by Stephen, framed as a question. We could train up generations of architects to be better ethnographers, to be better um, community activists. We could also include ethnographers in master planning. We could include a wider range of disciplinary professions, including anthropologists, in some of these conversations around what the built environment looks like. Um, should we? Um, definitely, because I, I, I won't mention any names. I once in a, I was in a meeting and I asked about community engagement and, oops, sorry, that was my cue to end at the talk. And I was, I was, and I asked about community engagement and I was told that's too political. And I, I don't agree with that. I don't think it's political. I think it's, uh, it's, it's being, um, empathetic. And that's what we need at this time, especially. And if, if that comes through being an ethnographer, yes, definitely we should introduce this kind of practice with all those professions that's mentioned by, by the person who questioned. <laughs> there are a few specific questions here about um, some of the project works that you've mentioned. Given that we've got a little bit of time, I'm gonna try and, and ask you some of those. So Paul asks here, you mentioned that there's a social stigma around using certain local materials like bamboo. Did applying them in the project help change attitudes? Um, first of all, I'm very much against telling people how to build. It, it was an example. Um, and some people just said to me things like, oh, uh, we, could, we could never build like this. It, it's only because they haven't tried. But... Um, so um, has it changed their attitude? Um, well, I think in terms of the bamboo in this um, instance it has changed because people, more and more people are learning to treat the bamboo because they realize the benefit of having a, you know, creating that longevity of, of that material. Um, earth, I would say it's still very much um, an architectural practice that's done by women. Um, it's, it's very, you know, that, that's social stigma about, oh, if you want an earth building, you should speak to a woman. That's the kind of attitude that the men would have in, in the village. So, uh, no, I haven't, I haven't, I don't, I never advocate that I'm, I, I'm changing the way people practice or the, the way people behave. That wasn't the aim of this building at all. Um, the aim of the building was to have an inclusive team and to have as many people involved as possible in many different ways. Um, and it worked out that the women were excellent at building with earth and we wanted to use that in this case. And that made them feel ownership of the building um, because they can recognize the blocks that they build when they come into the building. Um, so yeah, so in this case it worked, but I, yeah, I don't think I've changed anything in terms of how people build, you know, <laughs> that wasn't the aim anyway. Got a quick question here from Daryl. What was your experience of disabled people being involved in the engagement processes in Bangladesh and also here in London? And how does disability and ableism help to inform the design process and the end results and the projects that you've been involved with? Um, yeah, it's a really good question. So um, we, so we, when we had the walk around, we had a few el elderly people who. Uh, you know, use this uh, stick to walk around because, you know, they had problems uh, with their legs and they insisted that there would be no stairs in the, in the building. So the building was raised. So we had to, you know, we, it was easy and easy fix. It's just needed a ramp from the, from the access road, which is fine. So things like that, for example, and then also the balustrade as well. Um, you know, we, they, they have, you know, told us that we would need some aid to walk around the verandas for example so that's what we implemented so it, it was it it kind of um it fed back from the earlier conversations that we had with with um the community members um in in terms of um uh, inclusive um team or build, uh, building in, in london um it's it, to be honest um our 
projects that we've done uh, are basically in the in the public in 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 being in the high street talking to people so um yeah so and and then most of most of the work is done by my students so um yeah so if it, we we speak to everyone we speak we spoke to um, what I say we, uh, my students spoke to partially uh, impaired uh, community members and so you know within their project they built a, a proposal for having a, a information stand with braille so and then there was the question of actually that is going to be quite uh, risky for coronavirus um, during coronavirus because you know people will be touching it then then you know they had someone another student then had a proposal of uh, a dispenser for cleaning in their hands afterwards and before so yeah so we 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 speak to um, whoever's on the street and we have come across people who have um, who face um, you know a disability of some some kind and we try to in, in, embed their responses in our design and our response to community engagement. Wonderful. Thank you. I think we should stop the Q&A here. I know that there are questions that have been asked that we have not yet gotten around to being able to answer. We will try to do so after this um, seminar. In the meantime, do check out the events of Fame Collective. They have a very interesting Twitter account. So if you're on Twitter, do follow Fame Collective and follow Tumblr as well, actually. And you can find out more about their events that are coming up, especially those of you who posted who are current architecture students or thinking of becoming architecture students and are from BAME communities, especially. This is a really supportive community and a supportive group to be surrounded by as you explore the profession. So thank you very much to Tumba for this fantastic talk. Thank you thank to you. all of you for joining us and a recording of this will be made available so you can review it all again at your leisure. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Seeing you next month, our next Inclusive Spaces event. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>